Okay, hello. Uh, some people here. This is really over to um, Okay, so first of all, uh, um, I'm hoping to get the first exams back sometime next week. We'll see if that actually happens. Um, but I want to remind everyone that uh, there is um, there is uh, the second midterm is due three weeks from yesterday, so it's coming up. Um, I used to just have one midterm in this class, and people complained that they didn't get any feedback at all until too late. So that's why I split it up into two. Right. Um, that does mean that the two come kind of close together. Anyway, uh, okay. So having said that, unless there's any questions about anything like that, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start again by saying where we are in the um, Right, so we finished the transcendental aesthetic. The transcendental logic, the two parts, analytic, analytic and the dialectic. And now we finished the first part of the transcendental analytic, which is called the analytic of concept. And we've moved on to the second part, which is called analytical principles. And the analytical principles, so um, it has kind of two expected parts and then one weird unexpected part. <laughs> the two expected parts are the schematism which um, uh, was all in the reading for today and much longer the system of principles, which the reading for today included just the introduction of that. So, I mean, most of the analytical principles, probably by, by length, most of the transcendental analytics, but anyway, certainly most of the analytical principles is taken up by the system of principles. Um, we aren't going to read all of that. So this is the first time we're going to be skipping a significant amount. Um, but, uh, but we'll read some of it uh, for next time. And then the, the unexpected part is called phenomena and humanism. Um, so, uh, um, so what I mean by calling these expected and this unexpected is that, like, if I were to explain the overall plan of it, first of all, what the analytical principle is doing in the overall plan of the book, and second of all, why it has these two parts, um, then it's surprising that there's another part. So, I mean, remember, like the overall question we're dealing with is how are synthetic a priori judgment possible? Um, so, I mean, and Kant says, you know, they're possible for two different reasons. It's one reason is because we have this pure form of intuition. Um, um, and that's what makes mathematical synthetic a priori judgments possible. And the other reason is, well, it's complicated, right? But the reason was basically given in the transcendental deduction to the extent that we understand, it, right? So, I mean, it has to do with the fact that uh, um, a discursive intelligence must be able to uh, regard itself as one object throughout its own existence. 
and therefore must be able to uh, organize its uh, um, what is manifold in its intuition under rules. Um, so, um, uh, right, so, so like that reason that I just gave is pretty much contained in the analytic of concepts and in particular in the transcendental reduction. And then in the analytic of principles, um, he applies that to show what synthetic a priori judgments we can get out of this thing. And um, he says, you know, this is going to be a complete list of the fundamental ones. Again, as with the categories where he said there's also secondary or derived pure a priori concepts. In this case, too, there's, you know, once you start with these principles, you can put them together and whatever. But this is supposed to be a complete list of the fundamental ones. Um, and why does it have these two parts? Well, um, so basically the idea is he showed here that the categories must be applicable to experience. And in particular to the manifold that's given in, that is what is manifoldly given in inner sense. Um, the schematism is going to explain what uh, um, what the manifold in your sense must be like in order to apply each of the categories. And the system of principles then applies that to say, so we can be sure it's like that, <laughs> basically. <laughs> So, um, so at the end of this, we completely answered Kant's question, according to Kant, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? So I like you might think the book would end here. Now, I mean, if you remember what the transcendental dialectic is about, you'll see why it doesn't end here, right? Because there's Kant says, but nevertheless, there's a tendency to think that and it's um, it's a tendency that's so strong. It's like an optical illusion, right? Just like even if you understand, even if you know an optical illusion is, is an illusion, you still see it. You never stop seeing it. You just have to correct for it, right? So he says there's an illusion like that called transcendental illusion that makes it seem like we're capable of more synthetic a priori. Um, knowledge that goes beyond the bounds of possible experience. So, you know, this part of the book is going to explain where that illusion comes from, you know, and in detail in each particular case. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, point out in each case what the illusion is. Basically. So, um, so that's why the book, or at least the doctrine of elements, doesn't end. Here. But as I said, what surprised me is that the transcendental analytic doesn't end here. And in particular, the analytical principles doesn't end here, but there's this other part that um, um, suddenly appears. So, when you get to that, I'll try to explain what that's doing here. Um, and also, maybe even why it's stuck in a you know, surprising place. But okay, so we haven't got to that yet. That's just the overall view of where we are. Are there questions about that before I erase this? Okay. Um, I, I have a question. <laughs> so, um, basically, like the central point of the analytic of principles um comes towards the end of today's reading not the very end but it's towards the end um it's like now print smith page number c b197 it's kemp smith page 194 and it's called 
the highest principle of all synthetic judgments. So, I mean, I'm starting with this because I'm starting with this because, uh, like going forward from this, we're supposed to be able to see how the individual principles are going to be proved in the system of principles. We're going backward from this, we're supposed to be able to see uh, why the schematism is necessary. So the principle is. Uh, Every object in under the necessary conditions of synthetic unity. of the manifold of intuition the a possible experience. So um without Yet going into the details of what this means, I want to first compare it to what Todd calls the highest principle of all analytic judgments. So the highest principle of all analytic judgments is the principle of contradiction. That is, as Todd expresses it, um, that no predicate contradictory of the thing can belong to it. <clears throat> that's on the 191. So, um, so this is called the highest principle of all synthetic judgments. This is called the highest principle of all analytic judgments. But the truth is, in a sense, they're both principles of all judgments. In what sense are they both principles of all judgments? Were they both all pr principles? Negatively speaking, they're both principles of all judgments, right? So this one, the principle of contradiction, um, is uh, a rule that no judgment can violate without, uh, as Kant understands it, um, sort of failing to be a judgment. Right, so if your judgment is like, for example, let's say that uh, let's say your definition of gold includes now again, Kant doesn't really think that empirical concepts have definitions, right? So this example is, I mean, I keep going back to this example, but. <laughs> You have to remember there's something a little bit weird about it from Kant's point of view. But uh, so suppose your definition of gold includes that it's yellow. So if you make a judgment, some gold is not yellow, it violates this principle. And Kant says the way Kant thinks of that is that um, 
it violates the conditions for something to count as a judgment at all before we even start asking what it's about. Right? I mean, if you think of that example, you don't have to know what gold or yellow are. Someone tells you that gold by definition is yellow, and you know the judgment that some gold is not yellow is false. Right? It doesn't have anything to do with, with um, knowing how to recognize gold, knowing how to being able to refer to gold. Just by examining the judgment itself internally, you can see there's something wrong with it. And that, again, is why um, uh, this rule is said by Kant to belong to formal logic. Formal logic is the rules of the understanding considered uh, in abstraction from the fact that our concepts refer to something. Right? Just looking at them internally and seeing if they're okay or not. Um, and the same thing goes for judgments. Right? So, so again, the way Kant sees it, the problem with saying, or maybe like a better example, a better example according to Kant would be some bodies are not extended. <laughs> But so some gold is not yellow, it's even yellow is part of the definition of gold, or some bodies are not extended. Um, the, you know, I mean, it is false, but uh, the problem with it isn't that it's false in the sense that it doesn't match its object. The problem with it is that um, it fails to be the kind of thing that an object could possibly be. Right? It's like, um, it expresses. Um, a rule on a, you know, it, remember, a, a judgment is like the application of a rule on a condition. And in this case, the condition uh, contradicts the rule. So uh, you don't really have a start of trying to apply the rule on that condition. The condition and the rule contradict each other. So, like I said, in a negative sense, therefore, this is a principle of all judgments. That is, no, no judgment at all can violate it without having something internally wrong with it that makes it, I think, again, from Kant's point of view, not exactly amount to a judgment at all. So, similarly, Well, okay, and so I say one more thing about that. So, so why call it the highest principle of all analytic judgments? Well, in a negative sense, it's the principle of all judgments, but in a positive sense, that is, what judgment can you actually get out of this? As opposed to just right, like the negative sense says, no judgment can violate. But what what judgments can you actually see are true because of this principle? And the answer is judgments whose opposite would involve a contradiction, right? Because since, again, no judgment at all can violate of this, uh, if the negation of a judgment would violate it, then, right? Like, so if the negation of A If not A would violate this, then A must be true. So what kind of judgment is it where the negation of the judgment violates this principle? Well, like I said, you know, so if, some gold is not yellow, violates this principle because yellow is part of the definition of gold. That is, yellow is already contained in the concept gold. We're not adding anything new to the subject. Um, or sorry, we're taking away some, we're trying to take away something that's already included in the subject. That's what makes it a contradiction. 
solidification of that is going to be um, something where the predicate is included in this. We're affirming it at this point. Was that kind of clear? I feel like I made that seem more complicated than this. I'll, I'll say it again, right? Like the reason, and I'm sorry, it's kind of distracting me because I have to change the sun for all of it. That's where it goes. <laughs> so the reason this violates the principle of contradiction is the subject already has yellow in it. And now um, we're trying to attach. We're, we're trying to say this this subject already has yellow in it. Um, doesn't have yellow. The subject gold already has yellow in it, and we're violating the principle of contradiction by trying to say that this um, that the thing that falls under this concept isn't yellow. When yellow is in the concept. That's why it violates the law of contradiction. So um, the negation of that is going to be when we say that the thing that falls under the concept has to be. Okay, because the because this one violates the principle of contradiction, so it must be false. Its negation must be true. And the negation again is saying that yellow does belong to the thing falling. Down. So all the things that you all the positive results that you get from the principle of contradiction are going to be like this, right? They're going to say um, it's not not true that something that's, that's in the concept applies to the object of the concept. Right, so like in this case, it's not not true that yellow applies to everything that's gold. Or in other words, it's true that yellow applies to everything that's gold. Right, so those the judgments like that are like you know, one of those Right, every analytic judgment is one that where the predicate is already included in the subject. So, um, so the negations of violations of this principle are analytic judgments. So, from this principle, from from this negative principle, we conclude that all the analytic judgments. Are the and in that sense, it's the, it's the principle of all analytic judgments. Some people are still not looking happy about this. They, <laughs> okay, come on. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, um, so similarly, in this case, so the problem here, a judgment that violates this, is not self contradictory. But the problem with it is going to be, and I'll explain why in a second, the problem with the judgment that violates this is going to be that although it's not contradictory, it doesn't uh, possibly judge something about any object. Right? That is, we're not possibly referring to anything when we make this judgment. So although it's not self-contradictory, it's empty. It's not about anything. Right? It's not about any possible object of our cognition. So in that negative sense, again, this is going to be a principle of all judgments. Right? Like every judgment, in order not to be empty, will have to not violate this. Yeah. So you said both of these apply to all kinds of judgments, even though they apply to more but so that it's just that whatever standard judgment. Even right. though they what? So you said it's a um 
to the first step, which is sympathetic judgments. That also applies to all kinds of things. But I think that's a yeah, I was hesitating about that a little bit, but yeah, I think it's true, right? That it's even an analytic judgment. So, like, if I say, you know, um, something like, all monads are simple, <laughs> right? So, like, this is an analytic judgment. And so, like, in some sense, Hodge is going to say that, yes, we can derive from this principle that it, it must be um, um, the, the best way to think about this is that, that it would be true of anything that we were able to think about. That we're able to to know one, right? Like if I mean that is, but I mean here I'm assuming that that somehow simplicity is part of the definition of a model, right? So you know, so this judgment would be um, would be true of anything we're able to cognize. However, according to positive violates this principle, so since it violates this principle, its truth is no good. It's not true about it. Um, well, uh, it violates it because I mean, that is, <laughs> um, I guess the easiest way to see it violates it is that by definition, like a monad is not something we could encounter and experience. So, um, so, uh, it doesn't stand under the necessary condition of synthetic unity of the manifold and intuition and impossible experience. And so, um, uh, right. So, so yeah. So I feel I think it's true. Both of these are principles of all judgments. Although it's also true that this one is. Not as interesting when it comes to analytic yet, right? but um, we're mostly using it because we're mostly using this to, uh, in the negative sense, to limit our possibility of synthetic a priori knowledge. So we're mostly using it to, to like rule out certain synthetic. Uh, but what I was going to say is that, right, so like if. Um, you take all judgments, not they they can't violate this one and still be like internally good. They can't violate this one without being referentially empty. But just as this one has positive consequences, so does this one, right? So the positive consequences of this one are when we take a judgment that. Um, violates this, and uh, let's see, that doesn't really quite, quite very well for my example here. Let me check this in a second. Um, let me think about that while I, while I give that example where that works. So, right, like if you say, um, some event has no cause. So, According to Kant, and uh, we'll see the detailed proof of this in the proof of what's called the second analysis. It's not that it's very easy to understand what the proof is, but anyway, we'll see it. Right? So, according to Kant, some event has no cause. I mean, 
you can understand roughly speaking how it's supposed to work, but then it turns out to be much more complicated than you might expect. It. Like you, roughly speaking, this is supposed to work because cause and effect is one of the categories and it must apply to appearance. So it must be able to synthesize, it must be able to synthesize the manifold um, of intuition in a possible experience. Um, uh, under the conditions of synthetic unity, this, this one of the conditions of synthetic unity is that the category of cause and effect, effect will apply. Remember that right, like an, a manifold is given an intuition, it's synthesized by the imagination, right? Like arranged or collected or gone through in such a way as to make it comparable to a rule. And then uh, it's the understanding contributes synthetic unity. That is, brings that synthesized manifold of intuition under a single rule. So the fundamental conditions for that are the categories, the application of the categories, because those are the parts of the understanding. Right? Like this, those are the components of the faculty of being able to subject the manifold to a single rule. So like it, so if one of the categories is cause and effect, then roughly speaking, cause and effect must apply to what's given in the theory. So this Judgment violates. It says, no, there's some of that because I can't. Um, uh, um, bring into a complete unity of experience with respect to cause and effect. So the negation of this judgment, every event has a cause. Right, so so again, this is like a this is like a contradiction compared to this. It's not a contradiction, right? There's no contradiction in saying that um, there's one state at one time, another state at another time, that there is nothing before that that determines, right? There there's there's nothing that happened before that from which to conclude that necessarily that change in state had to happen. That's not a contradiction. Those are two completely different statements. But Trump says, although it's not a contradiction, it uh, violates the necessary conditions of experience. So although this judgment is not self-contradictory, it's empty. It says something that can't be found to be true. If this were true, there would be no experience and I wouldn't exist. Right, that is, I wouldn't, there wouldn't be a single subject me that continues to come. So, um, so it can't be true. That is, it can't, part, it can't correctly correspond to an object if it violates the conditions of referring to an object. And since it can't be true, it, its negation must be true. The negation is. Every event has a cause. So that's how um, this basically negative principle also generates, also has a positive role in generating statements that we know to be true, just like this one, right? This one shows that analytic judgments are true. This one shows that synthetic a priori judgments are true. Uh, okay, is that clear enough so far? Because I think, you know, that's, that's, that's the most important thing to understand and analyze the principles. That, that's how it's all working. Um, and I mean, so like, although, this judgment, I think the analogy is even better than this. 
although this judgment is not self-contradictory, there is a kind of contradiction in it, according to Kant. So, um, if you look on B84, on Kemp Smith, page 98, Um, what? Camp Smith, page 98, B84. B um, Right, so he's so if you just finished talking about how this is a necessary criterion for all truth, right? A judgment can't be truly unviable with this. And then he says, um, these criteria, however, concern only the form of truth, that is, of thought in general. And insofar they are quite correct, but are not by themselves sufficient. For although our knowledge may be in complete accordance with logical demands, that is, may not contradict itself. It is still possible that it may be in contradiction with its objects. Um, now, I mean. Uh, a judgment may be in contradiction with its object, an, an empirical judgment, what is in contradiction with its object is empirically false, right? So if I, like, if I say, you know, um, uh, some gold is a liquid at room temperature. So, uh, um, we only know that's false from experience. But we do know it's false from experience, right? So the judgment, although it doesn't contradict itself, contradicts its object. That is, it's what um, what contradicts the judgment is gold. <laughs> gold contradicted by not being liquid at room temperature. Right. But um, in the case of a synthetic a priori judgment, or, sorry, in the case of synthetic a priori judgment, uh, of course, we can't have learned something about the object from experience. That's the definition of a priori. So, in what sense can it contradict its object? And um, um, the answer is that every synthetic judgment in general. So, right, like this is the judgment that A is B. Now, suppose it's synthetic. So, if it's synthetic, that so it means we're, we're like asserting this rule A on the condition that B holds. If it's analytic, we're doing that because when you look at the B, you can see that it contains the necessary condition for A. But now we're saying this judgment is synthetic. So, that means um, you won't find anything in B that makes it necessary that A holds it. So on what basis am I asserting that A applies on the condition that B? And the answer, again, as always, is, well, there must be something else, right? There's, there's something else that I also know about the object of B that allows me to assert that A applies. What else do I know about the object of B? So, like, Generally speaking, the answer is I have experience, right? So again, like if I say, uh, like no gold is a liquid at room temperature, I can't I can't conclude that from the concept of gold, but I can conclude it from the object of that concept because I have experience of that object. So I have experience 
that the thing that satisfies this rule always falls under that. So the third thing is experience. Right? This 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 law here is not a concept. This law here is gold, right? Gold is such. So um so I know more about gold than just that it's the object of the concept gold. I know more about it because I've experienced it. But now, um, suppose I'm looking at, a, at an alleged synthetic judgment where um, if the judgment were true, experience would be impossible. So in that case, I can tell before any experience that the judgment can't be true. Right? Because the only way I'm going to be able to assert this judgment at all is that by, by gathering experience in favor. But this judgment says in some way or other that there is no experience, that experience is impossible. And so it shows in advance that um, I can't be justified in asserting. And so again, in a way, there's a contradiction. The contradiction is not between the concepts, but between the um, the judgment and the conditions that are necessary for applying judgment. Namely, right, the necessary conditions of synthetic unity is the number of us. Right? Those are the conditions that are necessary in order to refer to any object at all. If I make a judgment that says that those conditions don't hold in the manifold given an intuition, then I'm making a judgment that contradicts the possibility of making judgments about the object of the Yeah. Can you just say it? Yeah. Is B and then are those both concepts or B and it? No, these are both concepts. Is it? So, yeah, I mean, in empirical judgment, like, you know, some gold is, or no gold is liquid at room temperature, there's both, and there's an intuition by which this concept is determined to its object. So its object in a like universal negative judgment like this is gold in general, right? Like gold is one thing, not like this lump of gold. That would be a singular. But still, like there's some way that gold in general is affected and that allows me to refer to it. But then there are also, you know, um, uh, I've got many, I've been affected in many ways by gold. And because experience is possible or is actual, in fact, I'm able to put together these manifold ways I've been affected by the world. Um, and that's what allows me to, um, that's what allows me to so much as think that this is true or false. I mean, it's also what allows me to determine whether it's true or false. Right, but it, but like that is the particular thing that I gather by putting together all my experience of gold is what's going to allow me to, um, uh, although not with absolute certainty or pretty universality or whatever, right? It's, it's inductive, so it's always possible it could go wrong in the future, but still it's going to allow me to assert on good evidence that this is true or false. But, but, but. Before that, so to speak, is just the fact that I can do this at all. Um, so if 
Now, I mean, so the, like it doesn't like some gold is liquid at room temperature. Obviously, like it doesn't violate these conditions. Um, but if the judgment were uh, some gold stayed in the state without a cost. Right, so that's an example. So that's not a fundamental pure a priori, or it's not a um, negation of a fundamental pure a priori principle. Right? It's not pure a priori at all because it's contained in empirical concept gold. But still, it you know um, it's going to violate this principle. Let's say some gold stays in state without a cost, and I'm saying that. Some gold uh, is can't be experienced. Yeah. So both these principles are pure theoretic principles. Both of these. Yeah. Yes. Right. But not only that, but they're both themselves supposed to be analytic. Right. So, like this is the principle of all synthetic a priori judgments, but. For that very reason, it can't itself be seen. Um, all right. So, um, you know, because like, if you kind of boil this down to what it says, it says something like, um, I can't judge that there is no experience of the object of experience, <laughs> right? So it's so um, so the opposite of it is a contradiction. Um, These are both principles that hold for discursive inference, right? Like these are about how it's possible to represent things using general contexts, but and by applying them to a manifold that's given in a sensible intuition. Um, this one doesn't mention because it abstracts from how the object is given to us. It doesn't mention that, but it's but it's about context. And judgments. These are things that discursive intellect can do. Um, and this one, of course, does mention the synthetic, yeah. uh, the sensible intuition. Um, I mean, it mentions it here. So, um, uh, Intuitive intellect wouldn't use these principles. I mean, it wouldn't need these principles because it um, it would have a general, positive, necessary, and sufficient criterion of all truth. Is it would be able to derive from a single principle what is actually true. So it wouldn't need to like somehow have principles to, to limit that by necessary conditions, like, well, at least we know that it can't be true that blah blah blah. Right. Um, so um so like. Therefore, an intuitive intellect wouldn't, the categories don't mean anything to it, and neither does the principle of contradiction. So, like, what is the formal, right? So, it has like a formal criterion. It's like its representations, if they're right in themselves, automatically represent what's actually true about the world. But 
right, but what do they, what does it take for them to be right in themselves? Not this principle of non contradiction. That again is that general concept. What is it? And the answer is we have no idea. We, have, we don't know if an intuitive intellect is even possible. We can define it without contradiction, but we don't know what would make it possible. So we don't know what this principle would be. I mean, this, you know, I mean, you could say like what kind of thing would it be like if the rationalists were right, so to speak, right? So it would be like the divine essence in Spinoza, but you guys know no one took on their deep, so I don't know. But it would be, you know, like some simple thing that God knows about himself from which everything else follows. In Spinoza, it follows necessarily. In Leibniz, it follows given the goodness of the divine will, right? So there's like, the, in Leibniz, the principle is that this is the best of all possible worlds. And from that, everything follows. <laughs> um, so, but, uh, but Kant thinks that, there, that those, those things only seem to make sense for them because they, haven't noticed that they've left the ground of um, possible experience when they're talking about things that you can't refer to. So if you ask Kant, what kind of principle is, is it that an intuitive intellect could use? The answer is we have no idea. Okay. Um, Okay, so the overall plan of the analytic principles, I'm going to read the principle. But I mean, you know, as, as Kant says when he discusses the principle of analy all analytic judgments here, he says this, strictly speaking, has nothing to do with transcendental logic. It belongs to formal logic. But I'm going to discuss it here so you can see how it's related to this one and it pertains to your other stuff. All right, so um, so the basic plan is um, that again, uh, what the understanding does is supply synthetic unity to what's manifoldly given in intuition. So like if this is the concept of the understanding, the concept of a single rule. Okay. And and look, look, this is an empirical concept of goal. And here we have sensible intuition, ways that we're being affected by objects. So this is called synthetic unity because this single rule is going to um, represent this manifold of intuition um, all put together as one. All put together is what's synthetic. Right? This part means together. This part means put. Um, and this is why Kant says that there's always a step in between, namely that something has to put this together in order that it can be um, represented as all put together at once. So 
that that synthesis and that thermal dynamic So the basic plan is this, like from the transcendental deduction, we know that um, the understanding is able to form at least one empirical concept. So this means there's some way the understanding can supply synthetic unity to the manifold of sensible intuition. But if that's true, it must be because there's some way the imagination can put together this manifold such as to make that possible. Right? So the fact that a certain kind of synthetic unity can be supplied to the manifold given the intuition means that a certain kind of the imagination can carry out a certain kind of synthesis. Right, so the two expected parts of the analytical principle work like this. The schematism explains what kind of synthesis the imagination must be able to perform. If the categories are going to be applicable to the manifold of intuition in experience. And then the system of principles applies the highest principle of synthetic judgments to say, um, okay, so therefore the manifold um, given in intuition must be such that the imagination can do those things. So this is saying, like figuring out what the imagination has to be able to do. And then the principles basically are amount to saying that the imagination can do it. Actually, maybe I wasn't going to do it in this order, but maybe it's good to start with an example. So, for example, the category of quantity. Now, Remember, these are the four headings, but sometimes these things themselves are called categories. In the schematism, um, these are the mathematical categories and these are the dynamic categories. So in the schematism, I, you know, I mentioned this already before that this was going to happen. This is what happens. There's one schema of the concept of quantity one schema of the concept of quality. And then suddenly we get the relation and there's three, right? One for substance and action, and one for cause and effect, and one for community. And similarly for modality, there's two. Um, and something like that happens again in the system of principles. So there must be an explanation for that. 
um, you might have some idea of what the explanation is, but I'm definitely not going to go into it now. Uh, I guess the main thing to notice is that it is like it's not just random, it happens over and over that these two are treated as single categories and then these are broken up into a one. But anyway, so I'm going to talk about the category of quantity. So, um, so the category of quantity, so again, like a category is a piece of the understanding's capability of forming empirical knowledge. Right? It's a part of that capability. What part of that capability is the category of quantity? Well, so it's the part that makes um, universal, particular, and singular judgments. Uh, Um, right, so like, for example, for any empirical concept, like let's say gold or cinnabar, um, it has to be able to represent its object as all the things. It has to be able to represent its object as everywhere different from itself. And it has to be able to represent its object as um, such that those differences add back up to one thing. That's the category of totality. So, like, um, to summarize it, this is to summarize the category of quantity in general is like the ability to represent your object as more and more of the same thing. So, um, how is it possible to represent something as more and more of the same thing? Well, um, so if you ask that question in general, Pop says we don't know. Right? We don't know a general answer to that. But we know how we're able to represent something as more and more of the same. Um, because um, the form of intersects, that is time, um, um, As a feature of successiveness, that um, every time comes after one other time and not before another one, and that um, you can get from one time to another time by going through that succession. Um, so, uh, the imagination can always represent something that's more and more of the same by um, rep by uh, collecting the same feature of it over and over. Until whatever part of it you want is finished. Um, so, right, so this is the category. This is the feature of inner sense. And counting up, 
This is the same thing. Because our inner sense has this feature that basically, I mean, put in a simple way, um, the form of our inner sense is uh, more and more of a thing. But now, not in the abstract, but in this particular way. Right? Like, um, the same kind of session over and over, up to wherever you want to get to. Um, because of that, um, our imagination can represent something as more and more of a thing, as long as that thing um, appears the same way over and over up to a certain point. So since we have to be able to apply this category of quantity, we have to, the imagination has to be able to do that. And that means that the things that appear to us successively in time have to be um, like composed of uh, units that can be regarded as all the same as each other and can be like successfully successively added to one another until you get up to whatever point you want. So you get up to whatever singular object. So the first principle in the system of principles is that every object of experience is an extensive quantity, right? Meaning exactly that, that if every object of experience consists of units that can be regarded as all the same, they're all the same in some respect. For example, they're all gold, let's say. And um, when you add up enough of that unit to get any single piece of gold that you're interested in. Right, so like from the category itself, you can't gather anything like that. The category just says there's some way of representing the object as more and more of the same. But in order to perform a lot in a sense, you can see what the way must be. The way must be that we can successively add units to get up to the singular total. That is, you have to be able to measure and count the measurements of any object. And that's where, again, that principle comes from. The object experience must be an extensive quantity. So this is the overall plan. Um, I don't know. Should I try this as a example or not? Because, like, I mean, having started with an example, I haven't, you know, said anything in general about what a schema is and um, what the imagination does, generally speaking. But yeah, I think it's good to have this example in, in mind because this is the kind of thing we're going for, right? So, you know, in this, like, but this was a category we got from the metaphysical deduction, from the fact that universal particular and singular judgments must be possible. Um, then in the transcendental deduction, we got that somehow this must apply to the manifold of given in sense. In the first part, just not knowing anything about our form of intuition. In the second part, knowing that our intuition was time and the faculty that was going to synthesize it with what we call imagination. That is the ability to recall sensations that aren't currently present. Um, and then in the schema system, we say, okay, now category by category, how does that work? 
for example, this category of quantity um, is in the form of R, of R in the sense time. Um, what does this faculty of being able to recall things that are not currently present have to be able to do in order to make this category applicable? And the answer is it has to, like, as I go, I have to be, I have to remember that I've already seen this before. That is something just the same as this. And I have to be able to add the one I'm seeing now to the ones I remember. And by doing that, I have to eventually be able to get to the end of the thing I'm trying to represent. The finish. So that means, again, I have to be able to count how many parts. Count its homogeneous parts. It's not, right? So he also says the quantity is a category of the synthetic unity of the manifold insofar as it's homogeneous, meaning like all the same. Okay, so are there questions about that? Because again, I'm not sure if I should have done this first, if I should have talked about the imagination in general first. Are there other questions? Questions in Zoom land? I mean, okay, the advantage of not starting with an example is I could have started with something that's much less abstract. It's also an example of something, an example of a scheme. But in fact, the example that's not used here is the concept of, I think you, I kept using it before because I knew it was coming up straight. So he says, so take an empirical concept like the concept of. Um, and I mean, again, I've already gone through this a few times because I knew it was coming up. But so here's the many ways I'm affecting in sensible intuition. The constant dog is a rule that the way I'm manifolding. A single rule, oops, that has to be maybe I should draw it on the other side. Right, I'm making these little arrows here because there are all ways I'm being the manifold way I'm being affected. Now, so the concept dog is a rule that um, according to which I have to be affected if I'm being affected by a dog. Um, but as Trump says, like the, when I'm actually affected by a dog, the way I'm affected is never fully adequate. To the concept. Now, I mean, I think, you know, uh, by putting it that way, to kind of emphasize this one part of the problem, which I think is is a real part of the problem, although, so, so like one part of the problem is that, as I put it before, I don't see the whole dog, right? Like, I don't see the inside of the dog, whatever. Um, so, like, um, the con the rule here like prescribes all kinds of ways of being affected that they don't all ever happen together. They couldn't all ever happen. Together. 
right? That would mean that like I'm being affected by every possible dog at once. <laughs> so the rule always prescribes more than is actually present in the manifold and intuitions. But I think it's equally important, even though Trump doesn't emphasize this as much, that uh, the manifold also always contains all kinds of irrelevant things. Right? Like, both because whenever I'm being affected by a dog, I'm also being affected by other stuff. But also because even the way I'm being affected by a dog, a lot of it is not necessary for that to count as a dog. Right? So, um, so like this, you know, this, that's a way of understanding, and it's much easier in this concrete case here, why it is that the understanding doesn't relate directly to the manifold and intuition. We have a rule, and we're affected by uh, being affected in a manifold way, but in order to apply the rule, we have to do something here. And the, the thing that does something here is the imagination, right? And again, like in this case of concrete case of an empirical concept, it's pretty easy to understand what the imagination does. Um, and it does it as Kant says by the well known laws of association. I mean, I don't know if that's really, and if even Kant thinks that's really sufficient to explain what the understood imagination does, he probably thinks it's not. He says it's, a, it's an art deeply hidden in the human soul that we'll never completely understand, right? But, you know, but at least on a simple level, like I'm not being affected by all the ways I could be affected by a dog now. But like the way that I'm being affected, call up the other um, um, possible intuitions of a dog by association. Because I've seen other dogs before. I mean, yeah, again, is that really enough to explain it? Like never seen the inside of a dog, as far as I know. <laughs> I think this joke is due to Mark Twain, where he says that uh, outside of a dog, a book is a man's best friend. Inside a dog, it's too dark to read. <laughs> but anyway, um, right. So, I mean, I don't know. I've ever seen the inside of a dog, you know. But well, I, I mean, I know something about what living things are like inside, even though I haven't seen very much of it because I've read about it. You know, like I used to have an encyclopedia with like. Transparency, where you can take apart the human body. And I guess a dog's kind of like that. I don't know. I mean, there obviously is a lot more to say about exactly how this works. But the point, but the main point is that something has to happen here in between. And that the thing that has to happen in it, here in between is roughly speaking, that on the one hand, like intuitions that aren't actually present have to be supplied. And on the other hand, ones that are present have to be, but not relevant, have to be ignored. Right? And that all put together, I think, no, not even all put together in a different way, but like that process is, is what Rock called physics. Right, so synthesis is, I keep telling it as this kind of squiggly line. I think, I mean, the thing is, the squiggly line is like, it's a way of going through this manifold and supplying the missing pieces and taking other pieces out. So then at the end, you have something which is prepared directly to this group. So, I mean, and you can see in the term the fact that I was saying that Kant's emphasis is on um, like putting together what's present with what isn't present, not so much on like taking out what's present but irrelevant. But again, I think it involves both. And the point is um, that even an empirical concept like dog, in fact, Kant says especially, it's especially obvious in the case of an empirical concept like dog, that it doesn't apply directly, that it applies by way of a procedure that the imagination has. So, um, I mean, having come to recognize dogs, having acquired the concept dog, 
involves having learned to do this procedure. That's how the concept came in in the first place. Right? Like, I mean, at first I just got a whole a bunch of different impressions, but I learned to go through them in such a way that they can be applied to this rule. And at the point that, uh, or compared to this rule, and at the point where I finish that, that's both the point at which I'm able to apply the concept, and but it's also the point at which I actually have the concept, right? Like, that's why this is an empirical concept. The rule didn't, although it's my rule now, it didn't come from me. It came from the object in the sense that I like learned to um, that there was a way of arranging the manifold in intuition such that it sometimes agrees with this rule. And that's where I got the rule. From. So um Because that's how I got, so this is the case of an empirical concept. This is like, on the one hand, this is why an empirical concept doesn't need a deduction, as Kant understands what a deduction is. Um, and also why, if I were to supply a deduction, it would be what he calls an empirical deduction. So a deduction is showing that the concept is, is objectively valid, that it actually refers to an object. In this case, if I manage to acquire the concept, then it definitely refers to an object, namely the one I acquired the concept. Right, so like something really did affect me in such a way that I could bring it under this rule, or else I wouldn't have the rule. So that's on the one hand, that's why you don't normally ask for a deduction of an empirical concept, right? Like no one's going to say, "Well, how do you know your concept dog refers to anything?" Because like. The concept dog refers to the things that we got the concept dog from, namely dogs, right? Um, but it's also why if someone were to ask you a deduction, you would give what Kant calls an empirical deduction, that is, you would go back through the stages by which you acquired the concept in the first place. Right, because that's how you know it's objectively valid. Um, so, that's something I probably should have said before when we talk about the transitive deduction. Now I'm going on to another consequence or another way of looking at the same state of affairs. The concept dog always applies to exactly. So, right, this again, I don't know if I said this. This, this procedure of the imagination that I acquire that makes it possible for me to, to acquire the empirical concept is called the scheme. And once I have the concept, the schema is what allows me to apply it. So the concept dog applies to exactly the things that fall under the schema of the concept dog. Because again, like this rule just is the rule that. Um, everything I can do this procedure with fits. Um, so, I mean, what am I trying to rule out here? Suppose someone said, well, there's a kind of dog that um, we can't experience as a dog. That wouldn't make any sense. Right, that is, there's a kind, there's something that conforms to this rule, but um, we can't carry out this procedure in order to show that the manifold ways we're affected by it conforms to this rule. So it's like a dog, but it doesn't look like a dog, it doesn't sound like a dog, it doesn't act like a dog, it doesn't, right? Um, so, you know, that doesn't make any sense because dog is an empirical concept. 
everything that's in it comes from a sphere. And this, I think, is what Kant means in this kind of mysterious passage at the beginning of today's reading, at the beginning of the schematism, where he says that um, in the case of empirical and uh, um, mathematical concepts, the concepts are homogeneous with the object that falls under them. Um, in the subsumptions of an object under a concept, the representation of the object must be homogeneous with the concept. So that's supposed to be true in general. But then he says there's no problem about that in the case of empirical concepts and mathematical concepts. So, like, I mean, um, it's hard to understand what that means because uh, Like if it means that that the concept must contain intuitions, well, that I mean that's not true. The concept is a rule to which intuitions conform. I mean, the concept doesn't contain any of the intuitions of the object, let alone, I mean, if it meant that the concept has to be kind of the same kind of thing as a dog, right? Homogeneous with the dog. So like my concept of dog would have to be a species of dog. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, like that arguably is something like the way Platonists think about concepts, but um, but not exactly. I mean, if they were exactly how they thought about it, it would it would it would be nonsense, right? And it's clearly not true that my concept of a dog, you know, there are several kinds of dogs, German shepherds and chihuahuas and Abe's concept of a dog, you know, big thing. <laughs> so they, like there isn't one genus, but that they're homogeneous, they all belong to the same genus. You know, so what does this mean? And you know, I um but it's important because he says the reason we need this transcendental schematism here is because the categories are not homogeneous with their objects. And something has to come in between to, to like mediate. So, you know, like an easy way to read that would be to say, so the concepts need the plural of schemata, right? The concepts need schemata, but uh, the categories need schemata, but empirical concepts and mathematical concepts don't need schemata because empirical concepts and mathematical concepts are homogeneous with their object, whatever that means. And categories are not, so they need something in between. The problem with that is then when he goes on through the schematism, he gives these examples of the concept dog and the concept triangle, and he says how we, we need a schema to apply the concept. So every concept needs a schema to apply. It. So, like, what's the special problem about the categories, and how can it be described as not being homogeneous with their object? And so I think the answer is what I was just saying. In the case of an empirical concept, the concept contains exactly what's in the schema. In the case of a mathematical concept, although it's a little trickier to explain, it's still true. The math, so it's like, what is a mathematical concept? It's like, roughly speaking, um, like a general way, um, the imagination has to be able to put things together if an object can be represented in our form of intuition. So like the concept triangle remember like one of the fundamental things about space is that the same thing doesn't go, go on in two different directions. Um, so these points are not the same point. And like another fundamental principle of space is that between any two different points, 
there's a single direction. So, like, the imagination needs these principles to be able to represent, like, let's say I'm looking at a piece of gold. I have to be able to go through the gold from one place to another. The gold I'm looking at is all the gold in between here. And that's possible in general because triangles are possible. Um, so, um, like this movement here of closing, uh, like knowing that these two points are separate, but I can connect them this way. That's like the schema of the topic time. It's so it's an a priori schema, an a priori topic. So it's like you can. It's something I already was able to do before experience. Um, well, I, I mean, I'm sorry if you didn't follow this. It's like, this is much easier to understand, right? <laughs> this is harder to understand. It should be harder to understand. It's, I mean, what kind of concept is time? You don't ever see time. Not strictly speaking. Um, uh, you know, how do we know that triangle is a way of representing a piece of space such that we can form this concept that refers, what does it refer to? Well, again, not the actual triangle, but the feet or feel or whatever, that doesn't happen. Um, as like, this is something you could remember from 100 C. Right, as Barclay and Hume point out, that you know, um, our actual experience doesn't consist of infinitely divisible lines or anything like that. Right, so, um, um, but, uh, um, what this concept refers to is a way, a general way, in which objects of uh, sense have to be presentable. Um, so again, the concept contains exactly what's in the schema. Because the the concept, even though it's not empirical, it comes from the schema. That is, it comes from the fact that the imagination has to be able to like go through objects successively. Um uh, that's how we know that this concept refers to anything at all, right? So, like Kant emphasizes this at several points in today's reading that even the concept of mathematics, even though they're a priori, we don't need their actual their objects actually experience. Still, they're only effectively valid because we know that they're conditioned for the possibility of experiencing empirical things. And this is my attempt to give an example of that with the concept from. Right, and it also shows why the concept Gigon that is that is a figure with two straight sides. Um, Kant thinks we can know is not a good concept because it contradicts the things that the imagination has to be able to do. Right, this this point lies in three different directions. Okay, but then when you come to the case of the categories, which are pure a priori concepts, in this case, the concept doesn't come from this. Right? Like the metaphysical deduction didn't have to say anything about the form of our sensibility, time and space. And neither did the whole first part of the transcendental deduction. So the categories would be the categories for any sense for any discursive intellect, whatever its form of sensibility. On the other hand, um, 
Um, and this is basically what the highest principle amounts to. Um, and like what's shown in the second part of the transcendental reduction. Um, um, there has to be a particular way we can do this in the particular case of our form of sensibility. We don't know any other possible cases, but we know that this is one possible case because it's actual. And there has to be a particular way we can uh, apply the categories for this form of sensible intuition. So the category is like bigger than the, the case that it lies to by our schema. Um, the schema is the way the category, the way our manifold of intuition, the manifold given in time and space, has to be synthesizable in order to apply this pattern. But that can't be deduced from anything in the, about the category itself. Um, kind of out of time, but I'll read this. This is from B185, Kemp Smith, page 186. But it is also evident that although the schemata of sensibility first realized the categories, realize meaning that they give them objective reality, right? They show how they can be applied. Although the schemata of sensibility first realize the categories, they at the same time restrict them that is, limit them to conditions which lie outside the understanding and are due to sensibility. So the schemata are what allow the categories to apply the object of our experience. But the schemata, unlike the schema of an empirical concept, the schema of the category restricts the category to a special case. So in this case, it does make sense to say there could be a type of substance that we can't experience as a substance. There could be a type of cause that we can't experience as a cause. There could be a type of quantity that we can't experience as a quantity, et cetera. It makes sense, but it's empty because we don't know how to apply the category in any other case but the actual. Okay, that's all I have time for. We'll see you Thursday.